Hey, it's Javier, and it's that time of year. You know, it's October. Things are starting to feel a little spooky. And every now and then I'd like to do a pretend Halloween episode. And so I started talking with my friend Brandon Sheck Schneider with the Southern Gothic podcast, which, by the way, you should check out. Super creepy, awesome, best audio production and podcasting in general. And this guy lives and breathes Halloween. I mean, this is like his Christmas, right? It's so, so Brandon, <laughs> welcome to Pretend. We are going to talk about, you know, ghost stories, ghost tours, dark tourism, yeah. haunted tourism. Is it, is it real? Is yeah. it baloney? You know, let's talk about it. And, and hopefully yeah. we don't ruin this stuff for, for everybody. I don't think we're going to ruin it, but I, I certainly, I, I, it's wonderful coming on here on pretend because, you know, we can have a conversation about ghost stories and stuff in a way that's different than I get to have on a lot of other shows yeah. and, and, and something from being on the inside of haunted tourism and, and, and giving tour guides out on the, or being a tour guide out on the street and doing these things and researching old ghost stories. There's so many inaccuracies there. There's so many things there. And it's the kind of stuff that I mean, you dive into all the time. So I, I think this, this is going to be a good episode, I think. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, because, I, you know, I live in North Carolina. And so I'm, I'm in driving distance away from Wilmington, North Carolina, Charleston, yeah. Savannah. I've been to New Orleans, yeah. been to Key West. And we've all, most of us have probably done a ghost tour. You know, we, mm -hmm. we, I've been in a, in a hearse. <laughs> like uh, a, a, a hearse one of the hearse tours. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I always wonder, I was like, how much of this is yeah. bullshit? I mean, like, is this real? Like, is it, are these real stories? And, and are, are the people who are delivering these stories, are, do they even know yeah. what they're talking about? So, so that's why I, 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 don't even know what we're talking about today, but I want to talk uh, to you because <laughs> you have the most historically accurate, you know, ghost story podcast out there. I mean, it, it is like, well, you ooh, think I do, right? I think, I've, uh, I've hey, I'm wearing you the t-shirt, uh, dude. <laughs> yeah. No, you're, you're right. You know, and that's, it's a question that I have all the time. So, you know, I was born and raised in New Orleans, right? So I grew up down there hearing stories all the time. You know, it, it was, it was just said so, that city so steeped in this stuff, like you're saying, Charleston, Savannah, right? Of course, New Orleans is way better, but that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> so going down there, you know, we, we you go in the French Quarter and, you know, there's just full of tours. You want a vampire tour, you want a cemetery tour, whatever spooky ghost tour you want, right? But as you walk by there, if you actually know the history, it kind of bothers you what some of the folks are saying, right? And you realize that. And it's certainly when we were making Southern Gothic, that was something when I initially started the podcast, that was part of it. But here's these stories that you might've heard growing up from your mama, right? You might've heard like, <laughs> all right, you know, here's this scary thing down the road. And then, you know, maybe the kid on the street corner or something told you something. And it was like, well, what's really under there, right? What really yeah. is this? And so, uh, you know, I make the show with my sister who is an archivist at the Louisiana State Museum. So she actually works in the French Quarter. Uh, regularly calls me annoyed because she goes to get lunch and she hears some tour guide saying something, right? All right. And I, and I told you, I would start you off with, with a really good story to really set the tone let's, here. Let's uh, you it. know, one that's like the, the, the epitome of it. It's the one that really we've sunk our teeth into. Um, it's from down in New Orleans. Okay. So if you head West out of New Orleans and you you go towards Baton Rouge, you end up on these long concrete bridges. Okay. And they just go over swamp land. All right, you spend about an hour and a half getting to Baton Rouge and about halfway between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, you're out in the middle. It's called the Man Shack Swamp. And there's this little place there. It's called Frenier. It used to be this town that was there, right? But all that's left there where this town is, they now have a swamp tour. Okay. So obviously this is a company. They make money off tourists coming out on swamp tours. Well, you go get on the tour, you go, you take the tour, you know, you pull up, they got flat boats. They're taking you out through the swamp. And as you're going through the swamp, they have there on the side, on, on the bank there, this little cemetery, okay? And this little cemetery, it's got like a wrought iron gate in front of it. And it's got a bunch of heads or a bunch of like, like gravestones. It's really wooden crosses and stuff back there. And they're all up there. And there's this kind of gate over the gate. It says 1915 above. And that's when this town of Frenier was destroyed. And over on the other side, away from the rest, is this other little cross over here, you know, and they, they tell you the story, right? About how this is where, this is Frenier. This is the people who died here from this, this awful hurricane that back in 1915 destroyed this town. This is a mass grave 
but they have that one over on the side that's of someone else who was buried there. And that person is a woman by the name of Julia Brown, who's supposedly the voodoo priestess who cursed the town. She's the one that caused this hurricane to come in and destroy everything, right? So, so of course, you hear this on the tour and on. It makes, it's interesting, right? Like, okay, it's, it's a crazy story. What time, right? of, what time of day is the tour usually? Is it like Usually the during, during the day? day. It's not really okay. at night, right? And, you know, <laughs> I was picturing at dusk. <laughs> it, it could be. It might be really cool if you go down there. But uh, now, we, alligators when I at went, night, it that... was during the day, at least. There's alligators everywhere. It's a fun tour. Yeah. It's not just about the ghost at that point, right? Yeah. But it's just one of the selling points. And, of course, the company has used this this story to promote itself in tour and in, in, excuse me, in TV and things. Right. So there've been some TV shows come out there over the years. They show the cemetery, they tell the story and this is how the story goes. Okay. The story is, is that this small town of Frenier was once this, this, this town of German immigrants out there in the swamp in Manchac swamp. And they were uh, harvesting cabbage and, uh, and um, timber. Okay. They were cutting down all the cypress trees at that point in time. And they're out there in the swamp and this particular swamp out there, there's no way in or out really, except for boat or train. It is a very isolated community at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, but there's this one individual that lives out on the edge of town, a woman by the name of Julia Brown. She lived there with, with her husband, Celestin, and she was born enslaved. Her husband, Celestin actually got the land. We know from records, he got the land because he fought in the U S army during the civil war. And this was payment was to have this land out here in the swamp. And so they lived out there for years and years. And as the story goes, is, is that Julia practiced voodoo. She was like a root worker or something like that, right? And uh, so they were so isolated out there. If folks got sick and, you know, it might take them a week for the train to come to get them to New Orleans, they might go see Julia Brown for healing, for some help, right? Something would happen. And of course, at the same time, she became like the local midwife and you know, she delivered babies and things like that. And they say for a long time, the relationship with the community was beautiful. She's a beloved member of the community. Everybody, she was taking care of them, delivering them as children. She's, you know, up in years at this point in time, like I said, she was born enslaved. This is early 20th century. So eventually though, her husband passes away. And they say sometime after he passes away, her relationship with the town starts to sour. I don't know why they say, you know, maybe it's, they started taking her for granted. They didn't, they didn't you know, they, they thought that she just, they were entitled to her help. Maybe they just didn't understand what she was doing. Uh, didn't understand her religion, things of that nature. Maybe it was race, but for whatever the reason she starts to sour with the community. And so people started saying when they'd go out to the, her cabin out there in the swamp, out on the edge of town, they'd go visit her. They would always find her sitting on her porch in a rocking chair, kind of hanging out back and forth, singing this one song. When I die, I'll take the whole town with me. When I die, <laughs> I'll take the whole town with me. So, I mean, look, you know, and here's these guys. The is uh, going, right? It's I know there's this song. You can imagine these guys are scared, right? They live in this dark swamp outside of the city. Here's this voodoo practitioner that they don't understand. You know, I, I bring it. I, I say this was a German immigrant community. So it was called Schlosser at one point. So I, I joke. These are people who look like me. Okay. Blonde hair, blue eye. SCH last names. Okay. You know, this yeah. is, this was so all these people like that. And then you have this woman that is entirely different from the community, right? And they said race, religion, all those things factored in. So they're scared to death. What's going to happen? Well, eventually she passes away from old age. She's human. It doesn't matter what religion she practices, right? So she passes away September 28th, 1915. And so two days later, they have a funeral for Julia. Now, this funeral, of course, this is a small town out in the swamp. They have it in one of the homes there, have her laid out in the casket up front. And they say there was only standing room only at the funeral. Everyone came. Everyone was there. Whether or not that's because she was this beloved member of the community who delivered babies or, you know, and she was the one who took care of them or, I mean, they were all scared of that song, right? Yeah. It was like last chance. Let's appease her spirit because we don't know what's going to happen. But while they're there at her funeral, they say that the walls started to shake and the wind started to pick up. 
and a rain started to come down and a storm started and they didn't realize because they were so all the way out there that a hurricane was making landfall in Louisiana at this point. Massive hurricane. This hurricane is the largest storm recorded prior to named hurricanes. Wow. Okay. 1915 storm. So these people, the walls are shaking. You can imagine they're thinking, remember that song that Julia was singing all those years when I die, the whole town with me. So they're scrambling around. They don't, I mean, they're going everywhere. Some of them may go get on the, they run out, they get on the train and they make the train goes about uh, maybe about a mile down the road. It gets stopped on the tracks. Cause you got the storm surge right. from the waters coming up, the rain coming down, the winds are over a hundred miles per hour. People are getting boats, trying to scramble. Some people are so trying to get away from the waters, they climb trees to try and get away from drowning, which, I mean, a, a much more horrific death even because they could hear their family and friends drowning below them. So absolutely horrific scene. And then of course, the day passed and over 200 people died in Southeastern Louisiana that day. And Frenier has just been non-existent ever since. All that's left is this little swamp tour today. There's a little restaurant down the road as well. And that's all in Frenier. So did she curse the town or not? Right? Did she curse well, the town? The timing is impeccable. Right? Absolutely. Here you have this this woman who everyone in town knows. Obviously, it's not a big town, but she mm -hmm. she's kind of like the center of the town. And here she is. People are hearing her rocking, singing this song. And almost immediately after she dies, the town yeah. literally goes away i mean all that that you mentioned was, it's, it's kind of chilling right yeah, yeah yeah and 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 these are documented things right the, the, well and that's hurricane. where i'll go with it and i i love the story i was just thinking about it. as i, I was, love I that was story going through you did i remember your series you did a while back that Santeria, that? Yeah, Santeria? yeah okay i remember that and i, I remember thinking about this one as i was listening yeah Voodoo. Um, you know yeah because yeah, I, I didn't have much exposure to that uh, growing up, obviously voodoo was everywhere, but so down, so in this, uh, in the, the historic record and all these things, right? What we've done with, with kind of looking back at the records and everything is that we know that that storm started to make landfall and that storm started in Frenier at her funeral. That, that is a true fact. There was an obituary two days later that talked about the folks in the community were there when the wind started to pick up documented fact. Okay. She's on census records. We have found the land. We know exactly which plot of land she owned. We know she had some children. We know about her husband. Uh, we haven't been able to obtain his, his military records, um, but we know they exist, right? Like yeah. we, we, we've seen them. If you understand records, like we've seen the, the indexes sure. knowing they, we just haven't gotten them. But um, anyway, so, so you have all these facts line up, but the question then becomes is, well, was she actually practicing voodoo and was this curse? And, and so what we've found over the years and the way we study is that stories evolve. It's oral history, right? Yeah. You know, even if she wasn't in that obituary, it never mentioned her practicing voodoo. But, you know, look, maybe they just left that part out. <laughs> like, maybe not. And we right? don't even know if she sang that song. Uh, I mean, exactly. Right? You know, so, so we don't we can't really pin that down. You know, as we, we trace through records and stuff we see in the 70s, we find out that, you know, there was a newspaper article in the 70s where a girl who had survived, she was like 12 years old when this storm hit and her and her family were able to get out. Uh, she was interviewed in the seventies and she said, no, 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 Julia Brown. She, everybody loved her. There's no way she cursed the town, but you know, she's probably warning us. Okay. And that's what, that was the take yeah. then. So you knew the history at some point in those 50, 60 years had picked up and then you get the TV shows, like I was saying. And so now we fast forward and we have this swamp tour. Okay. That relies on tourism income and they have this, really creepy little cemetery there. Okay. And that really creepy cemetery has no one buried under it. It is an absolute little Disneyland spectacle. What? It's so wild. that, that cemetery that you s mm -hmm. saw there in the swamp, yeah, that was off it's a prop. It's a prop. Are you now, serious? How, crazy you enough, that? no joke. This I did land, not see that coming. By the way, I I, it's a prop. I know, yeah. I know, I know. I <laughs> know. Look, you're, this is the only podcast I have said that on. Okay, <laughs> because I know your listeners, uh, you know, what? appreciate what this this is. So yeah, it's a total prop. Now, this land that they do the swamp tour on, we found it really is her land. 
This actually part of that swamp tour is part of the land that her and her husband owned. Uh, you know, so it is very accurate that way, but they do. This is a prop there. You can go look at pictures on the internet and everything of it. It's a great prop, man. But no, it's not where those people were but, buried at all. But if you were to take this tour, they would pass it up. They would pass it up. Group. Yeah. Now, now, depending on who your tour guide is, how much they play it up, you know, that's up to him. Again, this one isn't a ghost tour spot. However, here's the thing. Over the years, television has played a very good role in, in, in promoting this tour because they've been on several shows. They've been on. Uh, early on, there was an early MTV show. Oh, gosh, I can't remember now. It was one of these early reality TV shows where people would go to a haunted place. And of course, they came here. They were at that cemetery and stayed there at night, right? Is it haunted? So very much played up this. Uh, it's been on, uh, again, that Weather Channel show. Uh, recently, there was something called Alice of Cursed Places. They came out. They did that. So so obviously, this is a promotional tool for them. Now, as a prop, this is where we get into ethics and, and anything else you might want to talk about about capitalism, right? Are they, what are they doing here? Is that, is that a method for them to tell the story? It's a good way to tell the story and remind this? Uh, or is it just meant to be a kind of tourist trap spot, you know? Well, and then as a consumer of these things, you yeah. know, how much stock do you put into these tours that that obviously they are, it's a tourism company, right? You know, and, and yeah. a good story sells, right? So if if the real cemetery, let's say, was, I don't know, like 100 yards deep into the swamp, but it's not accessible by that right. boat, you know, it's like, oh, well, we'll just bring the cemetery to the edge of the swamp, you know? Uh, it sounds like how a horror movie starts. Let's bring the cemetery on down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it's like, as a consumer, you have to have a, a, a little skepticism, you yeah. know, but but we want to be scared, right? We want, yeah. that's why we're paying 30 bucks a pop, 40 bucks a pop, because we want, you know, to be freaked out a little bit. It's kind of like going to a magic show. We want to be fooled. Yeah. Yeah. But what's interesting is, that these are real events. Like there's a kernel of truth to all these stories, but it just depends on the delivery of the person telling the story. How much sure. are they embellishing or, you know, what are, what are, are some other examples of yeah. some ghost stories that maybe were embellished or exaggerated yeah. a bit? I couldn't believe the fake cemetery. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, awesome. it runs the gamut, right? And it runs, yeah. you know, and, and I think that this, this story about Julia Brown, it's, it's fairly innocent in the grand scheme of things, right? I, I don't think they're really, you know, doing too much. They're making a little money off it, but you know, there's, there's ones that are more, let, let's, we, we can call them innocent in a way of it's just, you know, it, it's kind of gaff. So, so we have, you know, I do tours in a town called Franklin. It's a Franklin, Tennessee, old civil war town, lots of civil war history. If there's a place that's haunted. It could be here. Right. And I go to this one building. So I started doing these tours a few years back. A friend of mine, she owns a tour company. Uh, obviously I tell ghost stories for a living. Right. So hey, she just asked me, can you cover one of the nights? And so I went and learned her stories and all and started doing, it. I've loved it. It's been fascinating. Obviously it's something I've been fascinated with. And, you know, she had been telling this one story probably for almost 20 years. She had gotten it from someone else, another tour guide when she started. And she's a total history nerd that is in the county archives. The county historian knows her by name. She uh, checks everything. But I learned this one story and 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 it made me question it. So it's this little building and, they, and I'll give you, I'll give you the, the story of how you would deliver it here. So building, it's built in 1821, beautiful, magnificent federal style home, right here, right outside of this small, beautiful Southern Main Street town, right? And the man who built it is a man named Edward Clouston. He was the local pharmacist here in Franklin. He emigrated here from Scotland and he had properties all over. He had a big farm out on the edge of town where his family lived. And Edward was so rich that what he did was he built this beautiful place right here in town as like an after church brunch spot, okay? Like this gorgeous property here. And, you know, he's politically connected, invited a lot of folks in to come. They say all three presidents with Tennessee ties have dined and danced on this hardwood floor. Okay, so rich dude, rich property, right? But according to the legend in the ghost story, they say that they say that Edward, he was in a rush to get this property done because he had a special event that was going to happen here. His oldest daughter was going to get married. And so he, of course, was going to have a big wedding 
invited all these people in as he would do, wants all the dignitaries to see everything. And the night before the wedding, everybody's in town. The church is beautiful, done up, ready to go. And everybody is going to go to sleep in this building he, he just built in town. They call it Clouston Hall now. So they all go to bed that night. And in the middle of the night, Edward and his wife were woken up by a sound out in the foyer. And they walk out on the landing. They look down. And they realize that their daughter, the bride-to-be, mm -hmm. had hung herself the night oh. before the wedding. Just awful, despicable. Now, they said for years, all the people here in Franklin, they had this legend. They said that, you know, look, it must have been she was in love with a boy down the road, right? It's right. Romeo and Juliet's story. And this was an arranged marriage. But in reality, what we know now, looking at records and everything, was was that this young woman was 17 years old and the groom was 48. So, of course, everybody in the audience now groans. Oh, I see, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, here's the thing. I heard this story, and I've done so many stories all over the South, and I just looked at my friend one day. I was like, I don't think this is real. <laughs> there are so many hallmark stereotypes yeah. here. Yeah. So we went down to the county archives, and we found out when Edward built this house, wasn't even married yet. Mm. So we went further and looked at census records. Edward didn't have any child until about 10, 15 years after this building was built. When he sold the house to the next, to the next family, he kept it for like 20 years. I, believe. I don't remember the exact dates, but uh, when he sold the house, most of his children were under 10. So we asked the county historian, who's gotten very well used to us with weird questions. Yeah. You know, yeah. like you know, asked the county historian and he just looked at us. He's like, where'd you hear that mess? Well, hundreds and thousands of tourists have walked past this building yeah. with ghost tours here, hearing this story year after year. And so it, I, I guess it's just an honest mistake that's been passed down. And do you think that it was... Uh like a story that just snowballed out, uh, yeah. out of control or do you well, think that somebody yeah. just like made it up? Well, okay. So part of it is, you know, and I, I know we're a podcast, so I, I don't know if we'll be able to show a pictures. There's this one picture. Oh yeah. That, well, YouTube that, uh, this YouTube. Brandon. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Uh, so. Anytime I have Brandon Sheck Schneider, I'm, I'm going to YouTube this thing. <laughs> yeah. People need to oh, see man. this. Is I didn't do my hair very nice today, Javier. <laughs> Um, <laughs> he has a much better background than mine. So. Uh, it's, all, it's all right. So they got, so we, what we do is we say, you know, of course, as uh, the way it went, all right, the way the story, you know, we don't tell this story anymore because it's inaccurate. Right. But it was told for years, you know, this picture that was taken and, you know, we, we, we talk about this, this bride. Okay. This is the way that like, you know, we're kind of instructed as like an early, like what it was, um, was you talk about this and, and you somehow slip in there that, you know, they walk down the stairs and there's their daughter, the bride to be, she had hung herself and she's wearing her beautiful blue nightgown, you know? And then of course, later you, you know, we talk more about the history of the building. Then we circle back after the history and we say, okay, you know, now about, <laughs> about six or seven years ago and, and about six or seven years ago, a, a, a young man was he came to the building it's now an art gallery his mother was purchasing a painting here in the building here okay and she'd heard the story before and she decides she's gonna snap a picture of where that that woman had hung herself because it is a well-known legend through time and it really is a well-known legend by the way people ask about it all the time but she decided to snap a picture of this spot because she wanted to take it home and scare her brother like any good, you know, sibling, teenage sibling, right? So she gets in the car and she realizes, oh my gosh, she's thumbing through a picture. She's like, oh my gosh. And do y'all remember what color nightgown she was wearing that night? It was blue, right? right. So, all right. So and, and we, I, all right, all right. I don't know how well we, could, we can see here, but, you know, so there's this like image that, that we show people or, or would show people, like I said, we don't do this anymore, of this kind of like what looks like a nightgown. Okay. Or what, oh yeah, I see it. Yeah, yeah you can I see it. Yeah, at first, it. okay. So like for the people listening, there's a staircase, and uh -huh. you, you're taking the picture from the bottom of the staircase. It's one of those staircases that turns and 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 it has like a landing in the middle. Fancy and, southern foyer. And it's not a very good picture. You know, it's no. it's kind of uh, like somebody just snapped it. But if you look closely, there's like it. It appears to be a lens flare from the light. Yeah, but. But in it's but coming look downward, close, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's not coming the same direction as the light, and it's, it has this bluish hologrammy hue to it, right? Absolutely, yeah. And yeah. you know, I, I don't know how this story started, I haven't dug too much deeper. You know, obviously, 
you know, my friend was horrified that she had been telling this story because she, you know, she had, she's so interested. She's horrified. Oh my but it, God. It is wasn't the real story, it right? right? It's it was the story, the story. Franklin. Right? Still. Well, I mean, it was one of like, there's one of three. So like, you know, when people come on a tour, I mean, there's, if you were, especially a local teenager, that's one that they'll ask for. So, I mean, I will tell it sometimes and kind of, you know, rearrange how, you know, I, I, yeah. I will tell people what, you know, what it is and all. And, you know, it might've started, you know, there was somebody on the tour a few weeks ago uh, and, and she said that she knew who it was that took the, she knew the gentleman who took this, you know, um, a few years back and, or excuse me, the woman who took this. And anyway, it, it, you know, so it's, it, who knows? It's just like a local legend. It built up that way. I say a very innocent mistake in the grand scheme of things, right? Now, now, you, now, as we're throwing props around, when you talk about haunted tours, and this is not something Mike Brown would do. Mike oh, Brown would man. not have not put up with this. He would have had all the research. It would have been, yeah. Yeah, yeah so uh, yeah, let's give a little love to Mike Brown because Mike Brown, for those of you who don't know, he's the host of the Pleasing Terrors podcast, completely different style than Southern Gothic, you know, with Brandon. But uh, Mike Brown, if it weren't for Mike Brown, pretend podcast this, this yeah. podcast you're listening to would not be a thing because that guy i don't know how he found my podcast and it was like six years ago uh, you know people don't realize when you start a podcast you have like zero listeners <laughs> you know? and somehow <laughs> somehow you get from 10 from zero to 10 to 50 you know and, and mike brown was probably one of those 50 and he goes hey i just listened to this great podcast on facebook you know, at a, on a Facebook group. And he's like, you should check it out. And from that moment on, my show took off. Seriously, yeah. the guy is amazing. And I've had the privilege and you have had the yeah. privilege of going to his Charleston, South Carolina ghost tour, which yeah. I want to promote. What was it called? I, I don't it's have it. Called pleasing, me. pleasing terrors. Well, the, the podcast pleasing, is called. Pleasing no, he calls terrors. the tours as well. Oh, you can go pleasing terrors tours in Charleston. Yeah. And it's yeah. fantastic. I That's mean, it killer, is fantastic. Yeah. And, and the thing is that you know, we were talking about this, Brandon, earlier that I don't know. I did not fact check everything that Mike Brown yeah. said in his tour in Charleston. But it to me, it sounded like he was just telling us factual things that happened. Right. But it was the delivery yeah. that made it spooky. Okay, and, and actually, can we take, uh, we're going to go on a little sidecar. We're going to get back to the, we, we, we meander back about, out in the swamp for I, a little while. I'm actually going to ask you about yeah. one of the stories that Mike Brown told me okay. and my family, mm -hmm. and you're going to fact check, okay? And you're going to tell oh, me no. how accurate the story okay. is, all right? all right? So, and so we were walking around Charleston with my, with mm -hmm. my daughters, and this was our first ghost tour. They were terrified and it's at night and we're walking around and, and there's this, uh, this little street and, uh, you know, there's this two story old house. Uh -huh. It's a restaurant. Yeah. It's called Pugin's porch, uh -huh. you know, and Mike Brown, and we're looking at it from the side, right? We're not looking at it up front. We're looking at it from far away and there's a window up on the mm -hmm. second story. And Mike Brown was telling me that there were these two women that lived there yeah. and, they were sisters, I think. And when they died, the house caught on fire afterwards and they renovated it and turned it into a restaurant. Right. And since then, the police have been called because they, I guess the buildings from next door, they see what appears to be a woman uh, outside the window. And there's all these mysterious things that happen, right? And that that creeped us out so much that that's yeah. the singular story that stuck with us. Did you I, go eat there? That's the real. Yes, story. you did. Yes. So this, right. this is where the story comes in because <laughs> you're going to all learn how yeah. bad of a parent I am. So, uh, <laughs> so we're like, this was Saturday night. We were leaving Sunday morning, but I was like, we have to get, we have yeah. to go to this restaurant. So uh, we, we were the first ones there on Sunday morning for brunch. We get there. And the moment you walk in, you see a picture of the two old ladies that used to yeah. be there. Like they have it like right there where, where the hostess is. And so I snapped a picture of the two old ladies. This will come into play later. So oh, no. so they take us, they take us around to one of the back rooms and, and we have, you know, brunch or whatever. And it was great. And so we I asked the waitress, I said, so where, you know, supposedly the legend, and you're gonna fact check mm -hmm. this, right? But supposedly the legend is that if you go to this one bathroom, mm -hmm. okay, and you look into the mirror, 
you will see one of the old ladies behind you. Yeah. Okay. So, and I asked her, I said, where is this bathroom? And she said, oh, it's upstairs and you guys should go check it out. And so we ate our lunch, our brunch, and then we got up and we went up the stairs and we went into the bathroom and I went to the bathroom. I didn't see anything, but then my daughter, she really wanted to see this ghost, right? So she goes into the bathroom. I take a picture of her looking. Oh no, no, no. She takes a picture of herself, but yeah. because we're all under the same iCloud. Yeah. Her oh picture, gosh. <laughs> her picture shows up in my phone and I'm outside the bathroom and I quickly Photoshop with a Photoshop app, uh, Shout yeah. out to Photoshop for this one. Yeah. I quickly photoshopped the picture that I took from downstairs of the old lady. And I like really roughly put her in the background with and turned down the opacity. And mm -hmm. when she came out of the bathroom, she was just looking at all the pictures. And there was like maybe like 50 pictures that she took of herself. And one of them had the old lady and she dropped the phone. And she was so freaked out. And I didn't tell her the truth until like we actually got home. But oh my gosh, it was, <laughs> it was the best Halloween yeah. ever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know. All right. So, how much of that What's story? Real? Yeah, yeah. yeah, how much of that story you know, was real? Fortunately, you know, that story, uh, you know, I did I did a little mini episode on it, you know, yeah. recently. I love that. I just I listened did, to yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's what I, 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 I stole some of Mike's stories after visiting and using this Halloween. But that particular one, I, I don't think there's anything inaccurate there. You know, really that house, uh, just a little bit about uh, what what is it's beautiful house It's a beautiful right. house, a neighborhood right, right? Yeah. And, uh you know they did live there zoe she was a teacher and all and all that right and uh lived at the property the sister they they were they were you know what they called spinsters right it's just two unmarried women live in the house right and of course passed away and zoe lived there and uh, she didn't actually die in the house um i, I believe she had gone to a nursing home and passed wow. away there but you know the, the the big the point is when the spirits came back was at some point i believe it was in 76 is when they opened the restaurant pugin's porch and when they were remodeling in the 70s they say that's when it stirred up the activity uh -huh. okay. it was those remodels uh the folks who owned it now but you know the, the one that i the reason why i went okay was uh the um uh, my girlfriend is way into animals and there's a ghost dog there too oh yeah that's I why it's that. called i Boogie. didn't i didn't like, know that part. Yeah, yeah she's like oh yeah. no we're going to see i want i want to play with the ghost dog but uh you know there's there's a little too there's a little right. burial plot for the local dog is pugin which was the, the the dog it was a local stray that they kind of took in and was eaten off the porch and all people say the dog still runs around between tables but you know I, you can't really fact check it you know i, I guess we could call the police department to see if some of those are true about the stories of that. You know, that's yeah. kind of the local lore there. You know, it, it is, it is a hotel across the street. Now it was once a neighborhood, but I mean, it just expanded so much. And um, you know, so the hotel, so that's the story is that visitors to the hotel will see a woman on the second floor. And so that you could fact check that or not, but the history sound, but the yeah. history. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, the thing that makes a good ghost story is that you have like actual events that happen. They're documented right. events. And it guys like you, Brandon, or guys like Mike Brown, who, who really are just great storytellers. Yeah. You know, you, you want a good story and sometimes you don't need to embellish right. history much. It, it, that story of the voodoo lady down in new Orleans mm -hmm. was creepy before they added all the others. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah, like I thought, yeah. I thought it was creepy by itself. You know? let's <laughs> back to the, yeah. Let's get back to what pretends all about. Okay. That's right. Yeah. All right. So you guys have probably heard of this place. It is called the Myrtle's plantation. Okay. Oh, yeah. It is considered America's most haunted home. That's what people always see. Oh, it is the way it's on all the TV shows. It is a plantation in St. Francisville, Louisiana. It's right outside of Baton Rouge. Okay. And of course this plantation it being America's most haunted home. They say that over 10 murders, or maybe just 10, 10 murders happened in the building. Some of those are documented. Some of them are absolutely documented. Okay. But there's this one story that has gotten really popular there. Okay. Remember this is a plantation as well. So very Southern ghost story. All right. And so the story goes is this gentleman by the name of Clark Woodruff. He uh, starts running the plantation. His father in law actually established this plantation back in 1794, 96, yeah. somewhere around there. When, when uh, Spain actually owned this part of Louisiana. Okay. 
And uh, so he establishes this plantation. Clark Woodruff is now running it. He married the daughter, Sarah Matilda, running the plantation, just doing all the, all the awful things plantation owners do, right? But they say that there's a spirit that came from this time of this young enslaved woman who walks around the property or appears on the property, and she's got a green turban on her head. Okay, and people have said that they have seen her in different spots. There's a classic photo. Of, we believe this girl named Chloe is even over on the property. This photo they put on all their stuff and everything. So people visit, they hear the story of Chloe. And who Chloe was, was Clark, Clark Woodruff. Uh, supposedly, Chloe was one of the uh, domestic enslaved women. So she basically was the nanny in the house. She was somebody who worked in the big house. And of course, as stereotypes go and everything, the way they tell the story is the pair fell in love, right? But well, yeah. again, this is awful plantation story. So this is obviously, it was described as a, a light-skinned enslaved woman, possibly of mixed race. And, uh, you know, he clearly coerced her into a relationship, right? She, was a, she wanted to stay in the big house. This was easier living for her there, than out in the fields, right? As the story goes. So she has this relationship with the man in the house, this secret relationship. And of course, at some point in time, he gets bored with her. He kind of, his interest moves on. He's no longer worried about her. And say she's just have broken hearted, right? Yeah. She's, you know, oh man, he's not interested anymore. And one day, you know, she's, she's getting really paranoid. She decides to go and listen on the door when he's doing business in his office. And he catches her and catches her eavesdropping on him. So he cuts off her ear for doing that. She's vicious. So, so she wears this turban on her head to hide this awful scar. And that's how people see her today. But it continues to go on that she is so afraid of getting sent back out to the fields that she concocts this plan to try and have Woodruff fall back in love with her. And what she's going to do is it's the kid's birthday. It's one of the kid's birthday. And so she's going to bake a cake for the kid, but she's going to be sneaky about it. And she's going to sneak a little bit of oleander in there, which is poisonous, right? She's going to just enough to maybe make him a little sick. She's going to nurse the family back to health. And then of course the, he's going to fall back in love with her, right? right. You know, he's, you took care of my, you saved my children, right? Well, you know, she does this and you know where this is going, right? She yeah. puts way too much oleander in that cake the kids and the wife and all oh. die after this occasion well knowing what she did she of course decides she's going to get out of the house she rushes out she goes out to the fields and everything and she asks all the other folks out all the other enslaved people out there to help her to help her get away because he's going to find out and he's going to come for her and of course they don't want anything to do with her, right? In fact, they know that if they harbor her, they're going to be in trouble. So they take her out to the levee out there and they hang her for her mm. crime because they want to make sure that he knows they don't, you know, they're on his so side. They did not. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So this story is told at the Myrtles all the time with this famous ghost, this, this woman named Chloe. Okay. This, this, this enslaved woman who had a relationship and, and had this horrendous murder. But this one in and of itself, there is absolutely zero evidence or truth whatsoever to it, to the point of even the stereotypes in the story uh, have become perturbing. Okay. Because was just, Chloe even a real well, person? Chloe, no, no, unfortunately, I don't think <laughs> Chloe's real at all. But I mean, just down to the fact we know some of the things about the story that we can prove. I know. Let's, let's talk about the, the provable. All thing. right. Sarah Matilda, the, the wife, she passed away from yellow fever. She wasn't poisoned. The kids actually, they passed away separate times. They, the two youngest children, I don't know if they're the youngest or the oldest, uh, but two of the three children, they did pass away within a year of each other, but it was months apart, likely yellow fever, something like that. Sure, the yeah. third child lived into her old age, had her own family and everything. None of those things line up with this part of the story, right? Very, which is really the, 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 the essence yeah, of the story. Yeah, it's like the heart right? of the story, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, so a lot of people have broken this down. A lot of people go out to the Myrtles. Uh, there's this this uh, a, a Harvard professor, Dr. Taya Miles. Uh, she uh, studies African-American history, and she actually wrote a book called Dark Tourism. It's a fascinating book. She came down to Savannah. She uh, was going to write a fiction, a period piece. So she was visiting Savannah, and as she went down there, she went on a couple of ghost tours and goes, what the hell? 
Like, like this is not, what is this? Right. So she went to a couple of these places. She went to the Myrtles and she really broke down a, a really eviscerated this, the racial stereotypes involved, uh, what this was, you know, the, the Jezebel character, you know, that they portray Chloe as, uh, you know, and, and what that is and what, what sex and stereotypes there and, and the Mammy character that, that would come just these mm. awful stereotypes. And, you know, and what, what we know now in looking at it is, this story developed likely back in the 70s. A, a woman by the name of Frances Kermine, Kermine Meyer, she purchased the property, made it an Airbnb, not an Airbnb. This was, <laughs> this was the 80s, right? She made it a B&B, &B, an actual B&B. An B &B. 80s B&B. Yeah, yeah, like a, a, an analog B&B. Um, <laughs> so, you know, so she, of course, wanted heads and beds, right? And how do right, you do right. that? You got stories and all. And, you know, maybe she learned some of these stories from the previous owner. Maybe not. Who knows? But she wrote a book and everything. And this story just took off. It was in, you know, like well, Timed Magazine and everything. They called it America's Most Haunted Home, you know? And so this story that really we don't even know where it came from. It's got this this awful kind of racial stereotyping that was just so you know prototypical for this this plantation culture to begin with, and, and it's gone on. And these folks still continue. I, I went and took the tour about two years ago. They're still telling the story, still oh, telling the it, story. It, like you said, it puts mm -hmm. it puts heads in beds, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And that's the whole thing with dark tourism. And we're just like you know, ghost stories. It's just the most. Um, the most innocent ways of being a dark tourist. I'm sure there's a lot more like yeah. creepy things that people do, right? To get yeah. spooked. Well, you know, a place like the Myrtles, it, it fascinates me that we have a story like that, 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 that can be so false and, and problematic at the same time. Because Exploitive, as, yeah. as I said, you know, yeah. I mean, there's, there actually were murders in the building. When a, a man by the name of William Winter lived there, uh, 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 someone came up. These were affluent people. Okay. So, I mean, they had money. They were very, they were in the community and everything. And uh, one day he goes, answers the door at the front of the house. A gentleman shoots him runs away no idea who has shot him he died on the stairwell crawling up the stairs to go get his wife you know so, so this wow. is a real real part of the story you know so so there's stuff there there are things there not to mention if you're looking for ghosts i'm not telling you ghosts aren't real okay as i was saying earlier you know i'm not saying that i i, I absolutely and when i talk to some of my ghost friends that really get into the paranormal you know, they'll talk about it as all kinds of theories and, you know, whatever. But if there's a place that's haunted, it's going to be a plantation. Think about right. the trauma that happened yeah. at this. There's so much there that could uh, could actually cause a haunting if, if you believe in that the paranormal in that way. So much trauma. But yet we stick to this really stereotypical story here to try and convince people and they've stuck with it. And that's what kind of the Myrtles can, can give this kind of, kind of thing. Of course, the ghost adventures have been there and, you know, all the yeah. TV shows and just flying in. So, so I say that's, that's kind of, you know, as, as we go down this spectrum of good to bad, I, I always feel like Myrtles really capitalize. It's a private owner. It's yeah. not a, they're not trying to save the house. It's not about preservation. It's not about anything like that. I mean, obviously, they've done a great job keeping the house. Uh, sure. I, I don't believe that they have a historian on staff, from what I could tell. It didn't really seem like a lot of the stuff was really uh, very well documented. I, I could be wrong, so so please don't come after me. Um, but, you know, there, there's a lot of inaccuracies there. It, it's a wonderful property to visit even. Maybe I'm covering my butt for, for you know, for kicking their tour or whatever. But it, yeah. it is. It's fascinating. It's, again, it absolutely could be haunted. Chloe's not real. Right. That's, that's interesting. Cause like you're, you're talking about like, you know, this is not just a little bit of aggregate, like the, the whole, the, the main this character in the story is not even real. And yeah. you know, uh, before we started recording, you mentioned the Winchester house and that yeah. piqued my interest. Yeah. Do, do you have time for one more story? No, totally. Yeah. No, I, I could it. talk about this forever. Unfortunately for your listeners. <laughs> Uh, you know, Winchester, that, that really, that, that really is the third element that I'd bring about here, you know, going from Julia Brown and kind of the just minor inaccuracies and all, you know, the Winchester house, it's, it, it's interesting because as most folks might know, this was, uh, Sarah Winchester, she married into the Winchester family. Right. And so she was the widow of the Winchester rifle, you know? So of course, yeah. uh, you know, obviously this is a big deal. So they say that, you know, the, the family was cursed by all the folks who had been killed by the Winchester rifle, right? And she was widowed and basically 
the heir to this giant fortune. So, you know, out in California, of course, she has this house that, you know, in her life, what she did was she constantly was adding on to in the creepiest of ways. She had right? an unlimited budget. Unlimited budget. She was always building. She never stopped yeah. construction. And there are in this building, there's like stairwells into nothing. Go nowhere, right? Doors, yeah. just everything. Giant prop, just wild. I mean, it is uh, the things nightmares are made of type thing, right? Well. You know, well, the actual legends about her started while she was alive. So it isn't it, it isn't really necessarily something that happened after the fact. Folks thought she was crazy. They believe that she thought that the only way to keep the curse off and, and, and I'm not totally brushed up all the way on it, but was to continue building that as right. soon as she stopped building, that's when, the, you know, that's when it would come back and haunt her or, or something of that nature. So, so she just perpetually was building onto the house over and over and over again. She's in the newspapers. They say she was involved in spiritualism and all these things. And this was all while she was alive. Well, let's see. it was about uh, within a year after her death, it was 1922. Uh, she passes away within a year after her death, it gets opened as a tourist attraction. Okay. Because of course, you know, what do you do with this property now? Right? Like, what do you, like, she dies, she has no heirs really, you know, they're going to, the city, if you go there today, my understanding, I haven't, I haven't visited. So my understanding is that the city is built up all around her. And then yeah. out of the blue, there's this, this little property now that seems small in comparison, but, um, you know, so it's, it's, it was a, a circus, um, a circus owner that purchased the building immediately became a tourist attraction, right? So, uh, it's still a tourist attraction. There's a big marketing budget with them. They do all kinds of events. They do stuff. Um, they were involved in helping make that, that Winchester horror movie, which was horrifically historically inaccurate, right? I was total leaning into the whole thing and all, and, you know, but um, two Halloweens ago, I br very briefly, I flirt, I'm not like you, I, I'm not a serial podcaster, but I tried to be at one point. Okay. I, I tried to come out. I did a show called ghost tour. With serial, my podcaster. serial podcaster. Serial podcaster. Like that. <laughs> That's uh, going to be on your tombstone. <laughs> that sounds like a t-shirt. I'm going to make a t-shirt. Sorry. I know. Didn't mean to interrupt your creepy what is, story. What does is, what is your wife call it? Because I'm sure it's more negative, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's so funny. But, uh, yeah, you know, I tried to. I tried to do, make this little podcast. I called it Ghost Tour, and we were interviewing ghost tour guides from all the years. It was a lot of fun because it was like collecting stories from places I didn't normally go. Yeah. You know, and they all had different spins on things. It was fascinating. And it, was a, it was a good time. It was a, it was a laugh. It wasn't like a horror thing. And we actually, for one of our final episodes is... Uh, the historian from Winchester Mystery House came on the show, which was this huge get. It was wonderful, right? And um, she came on and we got to chat with her and she talked about a lot about these things. As if anyone knew about, you know, Sarah Winchester, this, she even started working there as a teenager. And then, you know, so has been at this house for like 40 years and read all the personal letters and knew everything. And, you know, she, you know, is, is it telling us, you know, a lot of this was this buildup. It was this air around her. It was uh, even when she's alive. And, and the reality is even is that she probably was doing this. She had, she had the people there, the, the folks who did construction and families, they lived on the property there. And it was probably more, she was just so loyal to these people. She wanted to make sure that they continued to have work. And that's kind of, you know, was kind of this, she's a very kind hearted woman. And, and, and that's what the historian. It's so interesting that it turned yeah. sinister when, when uh, another way of looking at it was she was just giving people work and she's or being a nice I, woman. I thought, I, I don't know too much about the story, but I, when you were telling me that story, I thought maybe yeah. the real story was that they were taking advantage of this rich oh, yeah. woman, but I don't know. I don't know too much about the story, but yeah. you know, the thing about ghost stories is that the person telling the story is kind of forcing you in a maze, right? And they're not right. letting you see the other parts of the story, right? Like they're right. taking you down this path and you could only see the story that one way. And if you see it that way, then of course there's a ghost story, you know what I mean? But how could there, you know, but then you start looking at, the yeah. big picture and you realize that yeah it's real life life is complicated yeah you, know? you want the gasp yeah yeah right, exactly you know but the, what the historian said about this thing and about her and, and in that reality was you know we continue to lean into it 
because this is a historic home that needs saving. And it costs a lot of money to keep this thing. It is made of wood. And this is this is a lot of work to maintain this historic property. And so the way that we do this is is through that. It's through visitors. It's through visitors who who want mm-hmm. to kind of, you know, to flirt with this 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 stereotype. And so it seems like uh, you know, I say that's much much more innocent and you know, anyone who's ghost hunting Okay. We really go, we go out of haunted tourism, ghost hunters and things like that. Uh, They actually, they serve like an economic purpose in some regards, you know, a lot of- And a historical preservation. That's why, right? Because a lot of these private places will open their doors up to ghost hunts and those ghost hunters, they'll pay, you know, maybe a hundred bucks a head in some cases. And it'll be a private historic property that doesn't have a nonprofit or benefactors you know, and on a weekend, they could make a few grand from ghost hunters coming in, respecting the property and kind of helping take the case. And so, so there, there's that, you yeah. know, we, we, th- that's, yeah. that's our kind of our gamut on haunted tourism today. You know, well, that's, that's a super fascinating, man. And when you told me this idea that you had, yeah. I, I, I was like, let's do it. And honestly, before we press record, I had no idea what we were going to talk about today. So uh, I'm glad, <laughs> as you said, I have to weave you through Javier. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I, I was yeah. just along for the ride, just like you guys, but you know, Brandon next week, I was going to play mm-hmm. the pretend vampire episode. I did a, I don't know if you listened to it. Oh, no, I didn't episode. catch that one. Yeah, of real vampires. People, uh-huh. especially like in New York, in New Orleans, that yeah. that actually some of them feast on blood, and and right. they consider that they identify as vampires. And so I did this episode. I was going to re-release it for Halloween, yeah. but then you reminded me about the Santeria episode, which oh, is like, yeah. boy, that's a deep cut. That that's like way back early. Yeah, in the yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't know what we were doing back it. then, right? We had no so idea think, what we were doing. I think I'm going to play the Santeria episode because yeah. I actually would like to listen. I don't listen to my own podcast, but that one's a very personal one. For right. Me. That's what I remember. Yeah. That's why yeah. I connected with it was your, your, cause it's kind of what I try and do. Right. It was like, you, you knew this growing up, you knew what was like freak. You would freak yeah. you out about it. Yeah, but it, you didn't it was really no. Right. Right. I, I, yeah. This was actually something that I was afraid of personally. Yeah. You know, like when I, when I go on these ghost tours, yeah, whatever. I'm I'm not that afraid. But right. this really freaked me out. Like even my kids, they they see this stuff when they go down to Miami. We could be walking to my grandmother's yeah. house and then there's a bag with a dead animal in it, like uh-huh. uh, laying in, in the sidewalk. And I have to explain to them, like, they're like, why is there like this dead chicken or a dead goat's head? No, it was a dead goat's head. That we oh my gosh. Well, I did not see like that. that with voodoo growing up. So I, yeah, yeah. Like voodoo, this is yeah. stuff that we still yeah. encounter wow, like yeah. to this day. And, and so I had to explain to them, no, it's like, you know, some people practice Santeria, but then there's some people that practice Brujeria. And then I tried mm-hmm. to explain to them the differences, you know, once Santeria, I didn't even know much about it. It's part of my culture. And, and like, I know... Yeah. I know people in my family who practice it, but I just didn't know a lot about it. And so yeah. this was like my exploration, yeah. trying to learn about my culture, a part of my culture that terrified me. <laughs> like, yeah, just, I remember it very, really it, well. Like yeah. I got chills just thinking about it because it's very scary. But actually, after I was done doing that podcast episode, I learned to really appreciate that religion and the historical aspects of yeah. that religion and and it's not so scary i think some people use it as right voodoo as which you know like to, right. to harm people but, but the vast majority of people are not it's just an afro-cuban religion it's yeah they took they took christianity yeah. and they mixed it with african beliefs and you had something yeah so it's a cool episode I, thank you for reminding me i will play that because I think yeah. that would be a really cool Halloween episode. But Brandon, thank you so much, man, for for doing this. This is totally years in the making because we needed to to do this at some point, right? Uh, yeah, I know. No kidding. I, I I never thought I'd find a way on pretend. Right? That's right. <laughs> Most people don't I, want I, to be on my show, by the way. I, but, I know. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Unless it's through the bars, you know, your collect yeah. calls. I, I didn't think I'd actually make it here. Maybe yeah, dupe yeah. everybody thinking that I'm into a, a, a I'm a successful podcaster. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> are. And, and seriously, if you have not, I mean, this is the time of year. Okay. If you're looking for a podcast oh, yeah. and some really good ghost stories, but not, not only great, historically accurate ghost stories, but really well produced. I mean, you're going to listen to this thing and you're going to be like, this is an independent podcast. Well, and you're going to, you're going to, your, your yeah. mind's going to be blown. 
I'm an audio engineer by trade. That's how I yeah, started yeah, with all this. Yeah. So I, you know, I was an audio guy and, and I tell people I learned to storytell uh, from recording songwriters and country music and bluegrass. So, you know, I, I kind of, I came by this kind of honestly. And, and so it's, I, I, I hear awful things with the audio when I do it, but I, but of I do know do, I, I was yeah. able to, I was able to lean on that trade and in the same way. And that's, what's incredible about your show though. You know, you, you have this incredible way of telling stories because of your trade. And, right. and that's what, yeah, well, we, about it's, it's yeah. kind of cool that we both come from, you know, some sort of production background yeah. where we could make our stories better. But, uh, dude, you're an amazing ghost story teller or storyteller in Thank general. You, yeah. <laughs> uh, I would, I, some people tell me that they would, they want me to read the phone book that they could listen to. I, yeah. I, I don't understand that, but I, I would, uh, I would apply that to you. I, oh you man. Read the well, phone book and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, All right, man. Well, Brandon, thank you so much for coming out pretend and happy Halloween, right? Yeah. Happy Halloween, everyone. Good luck out there. <laughs>